And we're back here, continuing our discussion on things that you can get from sexual contact. Uh, we talked about some of the venereal diseases, things that cause uh, genital lesions and warts. This definitely falls under the category of things that you can get from sex, but not necessarily. You can get it from other things as well. We know that kids get lice all the time. Uh, so it doesn't have to come from sex, uh, scabies or pubic lice. Pubic lice usually comes from sex, uh, but, uh, but you do have an increased risk. And even though this is under the heading of gynecology, women and men get this all the same. Okay, so given that it's October and uh, Halloween is coming up, I figured this lecture was particularly appropriate because these things are gross. All right, we'll start out with our 27-year-old swimsuit model who is coming in complaining of genital itching over the last five days. She's tried switching laundry detergent uh, twice, and she continues to have itching, which remains restricted to her outer genitals. She doesn't have itching anywhere else, just her genitals. And we'll just say that she uh, also does not have dysuria. She doesn't have any vaginal discharge or anything. She denies itching elsewhere. She denies using any feminine hygiene products different from what she normally uses. Feminine hygiene products can definitely cause like an allergic-like reaction, which can cause genital itching. So that's one thing you'll want to always ask them. She is monogamous with her boyfriend of four months, and she says that they always use protection. Her past medical history is unremarkable. She doesn't take any medications. And then on physical exam, you note this. So you look at her pubic hair, and you see these little brown things attached to the hair, and then these little things. Now, it's very difficult to see this in great detail if you're just doing uh, a general inspection, but if you look up close with a magnifying glass, uh, these are pretty hard to miss. And this is pubic lice, crabs. So she has crabs, and why did she get it if she uh, is using protection? And the fact of the matter is, protection, presumably condoms, is great for uh, reducing the transmission of HIV uh, and other sexually transmitted diseases, and that's great that she's using it, but pubic lice is on the hair, and the hair is not covered. And so his hair comes into contact with her pubic hair, and they transmit that way. Uh, so uh, that's the way that she got it. Okay. So we'll talk about scabies. This is different from lice. And then we'll go on and talk about pubic lice, which is what this patient had. Okay, so this is scabies. Uh, this is the causative organism known as Sarcoptes scaby, which are multicellular organisms. These are really animals. They're part of the animal kingdom. And they are very distantly related to the spider. And they grow to around 0.3 millimeters or greater in length. Uh, but they're not quite as big as the lice here. So they're, you probably won't be able to see these with the naked eye. Although if you look really closely, you may. Uh, like I said, they're about a third of a millimeter. So they're, they're going to be hard to see. But, uh, but you can see them theoretically. Under the microscope, though, they'll be much easier to see. So how do these live? We'll start out with their life's, uh, life cycle as an adult. So the adult female will infest your skin and she is going to burrow into the skin down around to the level of the stratum corneum. So you're not gonna feel this because this is very superficial. So they bite, but you're not gonna feel it at all. And she burrows this hole and continues to burrow for about 10 days. And as she's doing that, she's eating your flesh and she's also uh, dropping eggs and fecal matter. And she will usually lay about three or four eggs per day, burrow for about three days, and then once she runs out of eggs, she dies. These eggs take a few days to hatch. Once they hatch, the larvae are gonna use that same burrow, crawl out of the skin, and then they take refuge in a little uh, hole. And the best way for them to find the hole is that they just find a little hair follicle and get down in there. Uh, it takes about a week or so, and what happens is that these larvae then begin to molt and they grow. And once they go through about three molting cycles, they are now adults. And then the males will migrate out of these little uh, holes in the follicles, and they then go and find females. 
And once they find females, they reproduce, they sexually reproduce, and now the female is fertile. She has uh, eggs that are fertilized, and then she will migrate out of her little hole, nest, whatever you want to call it, and she'll go and burrow into your skin, and then the cycle starts all over again. So these reproduce pretty, uh, pretty quickly, about 10 to 14 days is the... Uh, lifespan reproductive cycle for these organisms. The females are larger, not by a whole lot, uh, but they're larger because they have all those eggs in them. So scabies is most commonly not an STD. You'll see this in children. A lot of times when they have outbreaks, you'll see it in families. Uh, but they can affect the pubic area. They can also affect other regions. Uh, the most common I've seen that comes up on the test is uh, the hands, like the webs of the fingers. Uh, those areas tend to be affected pretty easily. Uh, the flexor surface of the wrist, the elbows, the ankles, uh, the axilla, the feet, the scrotum, the areola of the breast, uh, those tend to be the, the most commonly affected areas. Look at this, isn't that just disgusting? God, I found this picture and I just I had to share it, but it's just gross. It's a good thing that these are only like half a millimeter uh, because what if these were like life size? It's like something out of a nightmare. Okay, so these mites, uh, eggs, and the fecal matter they leave are obviously foreign. They elicit a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, and that's going to result in these erythematous papules. Uh, sometimes they can look like vesicles or nodules. Uh, and these are associated with the burrows and their little uh, molting chambers in your hair follicles. So you can see little... Uh, sort of like little papules along the hair follicles and then the, the burrowing canals. Uh, and that's the manifestation. Uh, because this is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, obviously you're going to have some itching with that. And with the itching, if you itch one area and then itch another area or touch another area, you can actually transfer the scabies from one part of your skin to another. And so you can have multiple regions that are affected. The burrows that they make are classic. You'll get that on the test. They'll tell you that there's these sort of raised burrows. They're usually about one centimeter long, slightly raised off the skin because they're getting down into that stratum corneum layer, and it causes the, the skin above it to sort of elevate. And like I said, it's going to be red, sort of erythematous. And in many cases, they're S-shaped. That's the classic burrow canal for scabies is they'll say they're S-shaped. They have S-shaped lesions. They don't look perfect though. They don't look, look like perfect S's, but they do kind of have a little bit of a curve. So think S-shaped scabies. Okay, so this is looking up really close, uh, but this is about one centimeter long, and this is the burrowing canal, and the eggs are going to be left in here. So you can see that it's kind of erythematous. It doesn't really look infected, but they can become secondarily infected. So if you have any reason to believe these are secondarily infected, you should give the patient an antibiotic ointment. Okay, again here you can see it's kind of curved, but really small. And you can kind of see these little tiny areas. These may be hair follicles where the little larva went and took refuge and uh, elicited a hypersensitivity reaction there. Okay, so you see that here too. The infestation can become quite diffuse. Uh, the longer this goes untreated, the more diffuse it's going to be. And your body doesn't really have a great way of fighting this off on its own because it's so superficial. Uh, so this will require treatment. A lot of times, more than one family member will be affected. Uh, because what happens is, you know, they're sharing household items like blankets and towels, and the scabies can get onto that. They can live a while there, and then uh, somebody else uses it, and it gets right onto the skin, and then that person is affected too. So you may see sort of household epidemics. Scratching can, as mentioned, result in a surrounding inflammation. It can also cause a secondary infection. Uh, and so because of this whole inflammatory reaction that goes on, you can get this sort of honey-colored scaling. And I see maybe a little bit of it here. Uh, not so much in these other ones. Uh, so you might note some honey-colored scaling. For diagnosis, a lot of times it's clinical. Multiple family members that are affected, poor hygiene, lower socioeconomic status. 
Uh, and then the appearance. You have these sort of raised, curved lesions, especially affecting uh, the pubic area or the, uh, the webs of the, the hands and the wrists. But it can affect anywhere in the skin, okay? Those are just the most common areas. So you can usually make this diagnosis clinically. Uh, however, if you really do need to know, uh, if you're unsure, what you can do is you can take some mineral oil, place it under the patient's skin, and then kind of use a, like a razor and scrape, very gently scrape the burrow sites and get the flakes that come off into the mineral oil, and then you take the mineral oil and put it underneath a, a microscope, and you can very easily see these. And what you're looking for are the organism, the scabies organism proper. Uh, you're looking for eggs, fecal pellets, or parts of organism or parts of, of egg. Okay, so this is doing just that. Uh, so this might be like some cells and a little bit of blood maybe that might have came from the scraping. Uh, but this is the scabies organism itself. This might be an egg here. Here you see another scabie, another scabie. So they're all over. Oh, so gross. I'm ha even having a hard time talking about this. There are very few things in medicine that gross me out. Mites and scabies and parasites are one of them. Feces would probably be the other thing that I really just do not do well around. Okay, so here, fecal pellets, eggs. This might be a scabies organism here, hard to tell. The treatment for scabies is permethrin cream. You can't get this over the counter. Some people will think, oh, I'll just get the stuff for lice. It's the same thing. And it is the same medication, uh, but the stuff you get over the counter for lice, uh, permethrin for lice, is not the same strength, and you need a much higher strength to deal with scabies compared to lice. So you need the 5% cream. This is prescription only. So permethrin 5% cream is our first line of therapy. You'll apply this all over the body uh, because the scabies can be anywhere, not just areas where you have obvious signs, and certainly not just areas that are itchy. There is another treatment, but it is second line. It used to be that for scabies and pubic lice, we used to just throw lindane lotion because, yes, lindane is more effective. The problem with lindane is that there are some side effects that are very, very dangerous. You can get seizures from them. Why? Lindane is a neurotoxin, and that's the way it works with scabies. It kills them by disrupting their nervous system. Problem is, this can absorb transdermally get into your system and cause you to have seizures. Uh, so uh, the way it works is it's sort of like a GABA antagonist and essentially what you're doing is the reverse of benzodiazepines and that can cause seizures. Uh, and so the problem was is that we couldn't give lindane lotion to children under the age of two. We couldn't give it to people under a certain weight. We couldn't give it to pregnant or lactating women. Uh, and then, of course, the side effects. So now we only use lindane as a second line, uh, if only if permethrin doesn't work. So lindane is a second line. On the test, permethrin will be the answer choice. I don't expect that they're going to ask you to choose between the two, but please know permethrin, first line of therapy. Lindane, if permethrin doesn't work. But know the side effects of lindane include seizures. We want to make sure that the patient is washing all their linens. Uh, and then uh, also that they're exer or, sorry, not exercise, exercising proper hygiene. Exercise is always good, but exercising proper hygiene. All right, so that's scabies. Moving on, we're going to talk about pubic lice, and this comes from the same, really not the same exact species, but the same family as, as the head lice that you see in kids all the time. Okay, so these are the different species that cause quote-unquote lice. There's the head louse, Pediculus humanus capitus, and this is what causes the lice in, that you see in like elementary school age killed, uh, kids all the time. And uh, this causes the, the head itching and then the eggs and all that stuff. There's the body louse. Don't see this quite as often, but this can affect uh, the uh, hair that's on the body, like body hair. I think facial hair too. Uh, and then this is slightly different. This is Therus pubis. This is the organism that causes uh, the pubic lice. And because it looks like a crab, we call it crabs. Uh, so what actually distinguishes these most is the size of their claws. 
So the size of their claws actually will vary and that determines the diameter of hair follicle that they will attach to. Because uh, otherwise these things would all be able to do the same thing. They attach to hair, they leave their eggs, they eat blood. Uh, and that's another thing. They, they do eat, they get their nutrients by biting you and sucking up just a tiny bit of your blood. And that can cause some, uh, some lesions and uh, that also is what elicits an inflammatory reaction and causes you to itch. Uh, so it's not the bug moving you around that causes to itch, it's the bug eating a little bit of your skin and getting some blood out and then causing an infl inflammatory reaction that way. All right, so we're going to talk about this one here, Thyrus pubis, the pubic louse or crab. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out. So remember that they affect, each of these organisms affects you based on the diameter of their claws, and that corresponds to the diameter of the actual hair follicle. Well, it so happens that the d average diameter of a pubic hair is roughly the same as the diameter of the hair of your eyebrows and your eyelashes. And so people who are affected by crabs can actually have those same organisms on their face, on their eyebrows and eyelashes. So if you think about it, you know, it causes you to itch, you itch your crotch, and then you itch your face. I know, it's gross, but if you do that, then you can transfer those crabs to your face, and then where are they going to go? They're going to go to similar hairs, the uh, hairs that are similar to the pubic hair, and that happens to be the eyebrows and eyelashes. So you can actually get crabs on the eyebrows and eyelashes. Oh my gosh. Gross, gross, gross. Okay, so these lice, as mentioned, depend on frequent blood meals, and they will leave voluntarily if the host becomes febrile or dies. We prefer that the patient doesn't die. Uh, so, uh, if the patient does become febrile, uh, they do leave on their own, but these are not going to cause a significant enough infection. Even though they cause inflammation, they're not going to cause an infection enough to cause you to become febrile. So that's just a side note. They're very easily communicated from one person to another via skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, really more hair-to-hair -hair contact, or sharing personal items. And incidentally, when they do bite and suck that blood meal out of you, that inflammation actually helps them because what does inflammation do? It increases blood flow, and that makes it all the easier for them to get their, uh, to get their meal. These bites as well can become secondarily infected, and so that will make the itching worse, may cause a little bit of pain, burning. And so, like I said, if you ever have any reason to believe that a lesion area is secondarily infected, if it just seems warmer, there's just more redness than you would uh, otherwise normally expect, don't hesitate to provide an antibiotic ointment like Nupirosin. Um, you're not going to hurt anybody with that. Uh, but that's certainly not going to get rid of scabies or crabs for that matter. Okay, so these bites... As mentioned, they cause inflammation, pruritus. Sometimes they can leave a small bluish gray mark, but that can be difficult to see. Uh, they call that a, uh, I think they call it a maculus ceruleus. Uh, and then the region can become secondarily infected. So these, uh, these crabs, what they do is they leave their eggs at the base of the hair, and it takes about a month for these eggs to then hatch. Uh, they're going to be at the base of the hair. That's where they're laid because the adults live on the surface. They lay the egg on the base of the hair, but you might not always see it on the base of the hair. You might notice it on the shaft because as the hair grows, then that, that, uh, that egg is still going to be glued to the same spot. And, uh, and so it may be on the shaft of the hair follicle. We call these eggs nits. Uh, to diagnose this, typically it's clinical. If you look very closely, you should be able to see the adults, or at least the eggs. Um, if you were to uh, cut off a few hairs, uh, you may see this even in greater detail under the microscope. Okay, so this is a perfect example here. You can see the adults down here. And you can see eggs on various hair follicles. So here's a good one. Uh, try and find some other ones, actually. This might be one here. When you see a little bit of redness here, that may either be from local inflammation or it can be minor excoriations from itching. 
This ha actually happens to be on the eyelash. So remember, you can get crabs on the eyelash. And uh, that's what we have here. This is a little bit more difficult to treat on the eyelash and eyebrow. Usually you use like some Vaseline uh, and apply that at night and that will kind of suffocate the, uh, the, the crabs. Okay. The treatment again here is permethrin cream. Now, you don't need, when, when you're dealing with lice in general, you don't need quite as strong permethrin in most cases to treat lice. Uh, so you can use the 1% cream. So a lot of times patients won't even come into the doctor. They'll think, oh, my kid's got lice. I'm going to uh, just get the stuff over the counter. And indeed, most of the time that does work. For pubic lice, a lot of times you will, you will need a stronger uh, a stronger product. And so you will need to use the, uh, the prescription strength permethrin. And you want to uh, actually this disregard this. Uh, wash all clothing, underclothing, and bedding. Uh, lindane can be used as second line. Uh, so we already mentioned what the side effects are of lindane, the limitations. Uh, so lindane is second line, but it is in your arsenal. So first go for the permethrin 5%, then you can go for lindane if this doesn't work. You should also evaluate these patients for other STDs because pubic lice is so strong, is, is very strongly correlated with sexual activity. They may be using protection, but they might not be. And so since this is a sexually transmitted, a commonly sexually transmitted uh, disease, you, uh, you may want to uh, offer an evaluation for other STDs. Other things, just as far as clinical notes, because these patients have severe itching, it might keep them up at night. So you can offer them uh, a, an oral antihistamine. A lot of times you can get that over the counter, like Benadryl. You might recommend that. Uh, you can also try some anti-inflammatory creams or ointments uh, to uh, help with the itching, too. And, of course, as mentioned, if there's any area that you think might be secondarily infected, go for a mucorosin cream. Not going to hurt. Alrighty, so that's all I've got to talk about. That was pretty gross. Uh, but uh, we'll talk in our next lecture about pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, which is one of the complications of some of these STDs.